Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. This is uh, a lecture on alcohol and cancer, and um, I try in the next 20 minutes to um, focus especially on epidemiology and also on the conclusion we draw from the data we have collected. These are alcohol attributable fractions for selected causes of death. And you can see alcohol use disorder and fetal alcohol syndrome are due to alcohol only, 100%. If you look at the cirrhosis of the liver, 50% is due to alcohol and 50% for 50% there are other reasons. If you look at the oral cavity and pharynx cancer, 30% of all these cancers are due to alcohol. Laryngeal cancer, 23%. Esophageal cancer, 22%. So that's quite a number. And if we go down to liver cancer, this is 12. Colorectal cancer, 10. And breast cancer, 8. These are lower numbers, but considering the fact that these are especially cancers with a high prevalence and incidence in the Western world, uh, these are important, uh, an important uh, influence of alcohol. On these types of cancer. Now alcohol cancer is an old story. This is a painting from Edgar Degas in the 19th century demonstrating that absinthe drinking in those days in Paris and smoking is a very bad combination and indeed French pathologists were the first to describe esophageal cancer in uh, individuals who drink heavily and smoke. However it took a long time actually almost a hundred years, when also in France, uh, the International Agency for Research on Cancer gathered uh, a, 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 a panel of experts, epidemiologists and basic researchers in the field of alcohol research together to um, finally come to a conclusion with respect to the data available in 2007 uh, to the topic alcohol and cancer. And the panel, after 10 days of discussing the topic, came to the following conclusion published in Lancet Oncology. Alcoholic beverages are carcinogenic to humans. The occurrence of malignant tumors of the oral cavity, pharynx, larynx, esophagus, liver, colorectum and female breast is causally related to alcohol consumption. There is substantial mechanistic evidence in humans deficient in aldehyde hydrogenase that acetaldehyde derived from ethyl metabolism causes malignant esophageal tumors. A very clear statement. Now, worldwide, alcohol-related cancer death in 2016 show that indeed the upper aerodigestive tract, the lips and the oral cavity, the pharynx, the larynx and the esophagus there are targets of, uh, for alcohol with a high prevalence of cancer. Also colorectum liver lower, but considering again the high prevalence, this is important and 5%, 5% for breast cancer. Now, that the fact that the cancer targets in the upper alimentary tract are so high has probably something to do with carcinogenicity in the saliva. In 2012, the total number of alcohol attributable cancer cases increased to 5.5%. And if you look at the percentage of alcohol-related cancer cases 2016, and these are altogether 100%, so, see, so you see most of the cases are then for colorectum and liver, because of course alcohol damages the liver and cirrhosis develops, and cirrhosis is a prerequisite to develop hepatocellular cancer. Now these are the curves and uh, the relationship between alcohol consumption and cancer is monotonic and without a threshold. I think that's very important. There is no threshold. There are some people, I come to that a little bit later, who are very sensitive. And the higher the amount of alcohol consumed, of course, as higher is the risk. And this is the curve for for cancer of the mouth and oropharynx, for esophagus and for larynx. And so you see with a high amount of alcohol, 100 grams per day, you have really high risks for these types of cancer. 
If you look at the lower part of the digestive tract, this is colon rectal and cancer, the slopes are not as steep. They are flat or they're flat. However, again, these are common cancers and therefore alcohol plays an imminent role. And uh, it has been clearly shown that any reduction in alcohol consumption has a beneficial effect on reducing cancer side. And finally, there is breast cancer. And breast cancer, again, has no threshold. And it starts already with low amounts of alcohol intake in sensitive women. We do not exactly know what determines that sensitivity, but uh, it's unquestionably related um, to alcohol. Alcohol-related cancer death rates are higher than death rates for alcoholic liver disease in 2016, and that means a lot since the liver is really a major target for alcohol, alcohol injury. Risk factors in alcohol-assisted carcinogenesis are heavy alcohol consumption. I showed you the, the curves. It's more alcohol, the higher the risk. Smoking, very bad combination. Poor dental status with the oropharyngeal bacteria. The bacteria can convert alcohol to acetaldehyde. Genetics, I come to that in a minute. Folate deficiency. Additional intake of beta carotene and vitamin A, which is not very good in the heavy drinker. Estrogens. And finally, precancerous lesions. This is reflux disease in the esophagus, colorectal polyps, and colitis, but also other types of liver disease. Hepatitis B, C, non alcoholic fatty liver disease, and hereditary hemochromatosis. And I discuss that with you in the next slides. Alcohol and smoking. Tobacco smoke contains a variety of procarcinogens and carcinogens. Some, as nitrosamines, polycyclic hydrocarbons, are activated by ethyl induced cytochrome P452E1. Tobacco smoke contains also acetaldehyde, and tobacco smoke increases the number of or oropharyngeal bacteria which convert ethanol to acetaldehyde. Smokers have more of these bacteria in their mouth, and therefore they have a problem. And this is a classical study, and I think a, a, a very, good, a very good data to demonstrate the combination, the synergistic effect of alcohol and drinking. You see, smoking more than 30 cigarettes increases the risk for esophagus cancer by a factor of 5, maybe. Drinking by a factor of 50, but if you drink and smoke, it's unsaturable. It's more than a hundred, more than 150, depending. So heavy drinking, more than 100 gram alcohol per day, more than two bottles of wine a day, or one and a half bottle of wine, and heavily smoking is the worst you can do. Now let's turn to poor dental status and genetic, and this has something to do with acetaldehyde. Acetaldehyde, carcinogenicity, and genetics. Now acetaldehyde, the first metabolite of alcohol oxidation, uh, produces cellular damage, inflammation, metaplasia, hyperregeneration. It has genetic effects and non-genetic effects. It leads to chromosomal aberrations, cystochromatide exchanges and point mutations, and to DNA adducts. Acetaldehyde is a, a strong carcinogen. And non-genetic effects, this inhibition of the DNA repair and the weakening of the antioxidative defense system. And it also leads to a change in methyl transfer. Methylation of histone and DNA does not work. All this works together in concert, finally ending up in cancer. So acetaldehyde is produced from ethanol by alcohol dehydrogenase and also by bacteria. Acetaldehyde is further metabolized by acetaldehyde dehydrogenase to acetate, to acetate, which is completely untoxic. So either there is an increased production, a decreased degradation, and we talk about that in a moment, bacteria are important. And I summarize bacteria, the effect of bacteria. Ethanometallizing bacteria exist in the oral cavity, in the stomach, when there is no stomach acid, and in the colon. These bacteria produce high amounts of acetaldehyde. For example, the acetaldehyde concentration in the colon is the highest in the body when calculated per gram of tissue and may exceed 200 micromolar after alcohol consumption. Blood has only small amounts of acetaldehyde, and liver also not so much. So this is really exceeding the mutagenicity level in the colon. 
these high acetaldehyde concentrations are carcinogenic. Now, beside that, acetaldehyde detoxification occurs via acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. And 40% of Asians, of Japanese, Chinese, Koreans, they have a mutation in the acetaldehyde dehydrogenase 2 gene. So they have an allele, which is the 2 allele, which codes for an enzyme which has only 15% of the normal enzyme activity. These individuals cannot detoxify acetaldehyde and it leads to an accumulation. When they drink alcohol, they have a lot of acetaldehyde present, they get facial flushing, they get the tachycardia, vomiting, they get sick, but they still drink. Despite of the fact that they get sick, they drink. And these are the data from Yokoyama from Tokyo showing that these people here, the ALDH21 heterozygotes, they have an increased odds ratio for cancer of the esophagus, for multiple esophagus cancer, but also for all kinds of upper aerodigestive tract cancer and also for colon cancer. So this is a human knockout model, more or less. Besides the fact that there is decreased detoxification, there is also an increased production of acetaldehyde. And there is polymorphism on one of the seven alcohol dehydrogenase, the ADH1C1. If one is homozygous for one for two one alleles, he produces or she produces 2.5 times more acetaldehyde as a control person. And this has been shown for the first time by the NIH. They compared ADH11, that's the fast metabolizer homozygote, with the heterozygotes or with the homozygotes for slow metabolizing ethanol. If these people drink little, up to two drinks per day, there was no difference in their risk, in their relative risk for oral cancer. But if they drink a lot more than eight drinks, the heavy drinkers, the alcoholics, they have a 40 fold increase risk for cancer of the oral cavity compared to the others. So this was the first time that somebody showed that very clearly. Now, we have studied a number of alcoholic patients. These are healthy control, the gray bar. This is alcoholic cirrhotics, alcohol pancreatitis, alcohol dependency. It's all alcoholics. And we looked for the ADH1C1 homozygosity. This is about 25% in these alcohol patients without cancer. If we look at the alcohol patients with cancer, upper aerodigestive tract cancer, hepatocellular cancer, colorectal cancer, all alcoholic cancer, then you see their percentage is du almost double as high. So there is no question that these people who have that homozygosity are high on risk. Next point is oxidative stress in cytochrome P450. This slide we know already, acetaldehyde production. But in addition to that, alcohol leads to an induction of cytochrome P452E1. And this is important because this is responsible for the metabolism of certain drugs, for the activation of procarcinogens to carcinogens like nitrosamines or polycyclic hydrocarbons present in cigarette smoke or in some food. And it's also responsible for the degradation of retinol and retinoic acid to apoptotic metabolites. And we lose retinoic acid, an important factor for cell differentiation. In addition, during the oxidation of ethanol to acetaldehyde, reactive oxygen species occur and they lead to lipid peroxidation, where lipid peroxidation products finally ending up in DNA adducts, which are highly carcinogenic. Now, this brownish color on the left side is the induction of CYP21 in a heavy drinker, and on the right side it appears after two weeks of abstinence. And this is a dynamic of CYP21 induction. Individuals received 40 grams of alcohol every day, and we measured CYP21 with the closed oxisone test. And you see already after one week there is induction 
After four weeks, there's tremendous a significant induction, but some are not induced. This is an inter-individual difference. Some are not induced at all. If they stop drinking, their sypteron goes back to normal very quickly. These are days, these are weeks here. Within, one, within three to eight days, it decreased after two weeks. It's almost normal, but again, some do not decrease. And we believe that those who are induced very quickly to high levels and those who do not decrease in their induction after alcohol abstinence, they have a problem with alcoholic liver disease, but also with cancer. I summarize on CYP2E1, the induction leads to enhanced activation of procarcinogens to their ultimative carcinogenic metabolites. Think about tobacco smoke and nutrition. It leads to an enhanced degradation of retinol and retinoic acid, resulting in the activation of the AP1 gene in hyperregeneration, preconditions for carcinogenesis. Induction also enhances the production of reactive oxygen species with lipid peroxidation and generation of carcinogenic DNA adducts. And it leads to enhanced injury. On the other side, if you inhibit CYP2-1 by a specific, strong, non-competitive inhibitor clomethiazole, there is improvement of alcohol liver disease in animals, there is reduction in carcinogenic DNA lesions in cell cultures and animal experiments, there is a normalization of retinol and retinoic acids, there is an inhibition of nitrosamine-induced hepatocarcinogenesis, and there is an improvement of liver disease in humans. So this is an important player. I summarize. Alcohol induces CYP2-1, two reactive oxygen species. They bind to DNA, lead to lipid peroxidation with products, and they bind to DNA. This is the damage. Then we have acetaldehyde on the other side, which inhibits antioxidative defense system. So ROS can not be detoxified. And it inhibits the DNA repair system, so the DNA damage cannot repair. They play in common. Folic acid and vitamin E is another point, and these are data from Giovannucci, showing that uh, there is uh, uh, an increased risk for colorectal cancer when there is high alcohol, more than 20 grams a quarter, a quarter liter of wine, with low methionine and low folate. And the reason is that the methylation does not work properly. Alcohol inhibits folate uptake and all the action of folate on the production of s methionine, which is an active methyl donor, and methyl is needed for epigenetic changes in DNA and histones. That's the background. Now, the retinoids, the case is that usually the retinol is uh, going to retinal and retinoic acid, but when alcohol is induced, cytoron p 452 one then we have an increased degradation of retinoic acid and of retinol, and toxic metabolites occur, and retinoic acid deficiency leads to hyperregeneration and to dedifferentiation, and it also is a prerequisite for cancer. Now, coming to final, um, final risk factors, let me say a few words on estrogens. Estrogens are risk factors for breast cancer, and alcohol increases estrogens by inhibiting their degradation. So small amounts of alcohol with low levels of alcohol already lead to an increase in blood estradiol levels. So estrogens are probably an important factor with respect to breast cancer and alcohol. Now let me end up with precancerous lesions. There is especially liver disease, NASH non-alcoholic hepatitis, hepatitis B, C, and hemochromatosis. These are the data on hepatitis B and hepatitis C, and we see with increased alcohol consumption, there is an increased risk for hepatitis B and hepatitis C infection. So patients who have hepatitis B and hepatitis C should not drink alcohol. Now, for a long time, it was suggested that patients with non-alcohol steatohepatitis should drink small amounts of alcohol because alcohol improves peripheral insulin resistance. Now, these are the data from ASHA, and they show very clearly that with alcohol, any alcohol consumption, there is a hazard ratio of 3.5 in NASH patient to, hep to develop hepatocellular cancer. And these are the curves. You see, even social drinking 
increases hepatocellular cancer development over the years compared to non-drinkers at all. So the alcohol should not be recommended in patients with NASH because of these risk factors. Let me summarize the effect of alcohol on carcinogenesis. Alcohol leads to induction of CYP2E1, which uh, is important in the activation of procarcinogens to carcinogens, and they can be easily been uptaken by the mucosa since alcohol is an excellent solvent. CYP2E1 leads to reactive oxygen species and nitrogen species, which may initiate the cell. Alcohol also leads to acetaldehyde with acetaldehyde binding to DNA and initiation. But acetaldehyde also damaging cells leads to hyperregeneration, epigenetic changes and has a, plays a role in promotion. Alcohol alters methylation. Acetaldehyde may play a role in DNA hypomethylation. And alcohol leads to hyperproliferation. All factors important in promotion, in the time of promotion over years and decades. In addition, target-specific factors play a role. Estrogens probably for breast cancer, cirrhosis of the liver certainly for liver cancer, and gastroesophageal reflux disease for esophageal cancer. When the tumor cells is present, metastasis may occur easier under alcohol because alcohol is a very strong immune suppressant. I summarize, chronic ethanol consumption is a risk factor for cancer of the upper aerodigestive tract, the liver, the colorectum, the female breast. And factors which modify the carcinogenic effect of ethanol are smoking, poor oral hygiene because of the bacteria, genetics, I discussed with you ADH1C and ADH2, folate deficiency, additional intake of beta-carotene, vitamin A, estrogens, pre-existing diseases, especially liver disease. Ethanol-mediated carcinogenic mechanisms include acetaldehyde and reactive oxygen species primarily generated through inflammation and cytochrome p 452 a one associated with the inhalation. In addition, alcohol also affects cancer genes and signaling pathways as well as immune suppression. Ethanol-mediated hepatic cancer occurs predominantly in a cirrhotic liver and the conclusion is for the practical um, for, for the practice, as a consequence, individuals with chronic ethanol consumption, more than a quarter of a liter of wine, should be checked regularly for liver disease and cancer by Fibroscan, endoscopy, ENT monitoring, and precautionary gynecologic checkups. Women with, women with an increased breast cancer risk, for example, positive family history, for breast cancer, premalignant pre breast lesions, and women who already have developed breast cancer should reduce their alcohol intake and should not drink daily. Therefore, it is mandatory that the gynecologist evaluates alcohol intake. Thank you very much for your attention.